Well, we are moving past the midway point of our series looking at the life of Samson. We'll wrap it up next week with my very favorite of all four messages. I hope you guys can be here for that. And if you've missed any of this, if along the way you've, you've missed some of it, uh, it is now, the entire series is now or will be online. You can go to our website and our Facebook page and you can watch it or listen to it on demand. So if you uh, want to go back and refresh your memory or you missed some of it, you could do it there. But in case you're just joining us this morning, you haven't caught the previous two messages, I'll just give you a little bit of the backstory very quickly to kind of catch you up as we look at this tragic, really tragic biblical character named Samson. If you don't know his story, Samson was actually called by God from his very birth. He was selected and set apart to help free God's people, the Israelites, from the oppressive hand of the, the dreaded Philistines. And so Samson, God gave him supernatural strength that it's more than you could possibly imagine. Uh, and he did it in order to allow Samson to do the things that God had called him to do in his life. But what we've seen by looking at this story very closely is that uh, we have a lot in common with Samson because we, each one of us, we have so much God-given potential. There's not a human being alive who has not be, been given potential from God. And, and just like Samson, uh, again and again, we can also make really poor decisions that take us in the wrong direction and we end up missing the mark over and over and over again. But with God, there's always a new day. And in the first week, we actually looked at three attitudes, three very destructive attitudes that can get you off track and make strong people weak. The first attitude was lust and, and, and it's epitomized by, I want it. I don't, I don't care what it's gonna take, I, I want it. And Samson, he, what he would do is he would pursue young Philistine women, even though he was forbidden to intermingle uh, with other tribes, he did it anyways. The second attitude we saw him display is the attitude of entitlement, meaning, you know what, uh, I deserve it. I work hard, I do things, I do some good things. And so Samson, he felt entitled to do whatever he wanted to do, even if that meant breaking his vows to God. And the third problem was this attitude of pride that we saw Samson. And he displays this several times in his life. And he puts himself, he actually throws a big keg party. He's not supposed to be around alcohol, but he throws this big party. Um, and, and he basically says, you know what? I know it's wrong, but I think I can handle it. I think I'm strong enough. I, I want it. I deserve it. No problem. I'm strong. I can handle it. Whenever you see that in somebody's life, normally they're headed towards destruction. A lot of people struggle with the stuff just like, just like Samson did. And what we see is that Samson was a, a very, we said, you know, Samson was a very, very strong man with a dangerously weak will. He had his good attributes, but he also had some bad things going on at the same time. And, and then that was the main idea of week one. The good news is, though, God makes a habit of, God actually loves to take weak people and make them strong. He likes to use the maligned and the low to actually... Uh, um, bring about his plan. Last week, we also talked about one of the big problems. We deal with this, and Samson deal, dealt with it a lot, and that is that um, Samson, you look at his story, there's no way you can get around the fact that he was controlled by his emotions. He's a very emotional guy, and he let his emotions totally lead him or control him rather than being led by God in a lot of situations. And in this biography of his life, we saw he gave in to strong emotions over and, and, and over again, and he hurt people. And, and, and not just physically hurt people, but he hurt people because of the decisions that he made and his emotions of anger and pride, you see them displayed in his life and nothing good ever comes from it. And, and at the end of last week's message, we actually saw a situation where Samson had single-handedly killed a thousand Philistine uh, warriors with, with the jawbone of, of a donkey, killed a thousand men single-handedly, just an amazing display of strength and skill, right? But, but then he kind of comes to his senses. You see, after the battle is over and the adrenaline is kind of wore off, Samson, he's in the middle of the desert and he realizes, you know what, I'm in trouble. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in, in trouble because here I am out in the middle of the desert and they're gonna come against me now. I'm public enemy number one. The Philistines are gonna get a whole army, maybe thousands and thousands of guys and they're gonna come after me full force. They're either gonna capture me or kill me or you know what, I'm gonna die of thirst because I'm stranded out here in the middle uh, of the desert. And it's at this point that we saw last week, for the very first time in Samson's life, we saw him actually uh, cry out to God. He finally turns to God for help. And we learned this principle last week that 
uh, as people, if a person allows their deepest needs to move them towards God, God will meet their deepest need. Not, not your wants, but God will meet your needs. What he needs for you to, God has given you everything you need to accomplish everything that he has called you to do in life. And when you turn to God and move towards God, God will move towards you and meet your deepest needs. Today we're going to pick up the story right there in that exact same spot. We're not jumping ahead. We're actually picking up the story right there. So Samson, he's in the middle of the desert and he cries out to God. You might remember this from last week. He's in the desert and in verse 19 of Judges chapter 15, uh, he cries out to God because he's dying of thirst. And God opened up a hollow place in Lehi and water came out of it. And when Samson drank that water, the Bible says that his strength returned to him and that he was revived. I mean, he finally turns towards God and he got his strength back and he was revived. He was restored, basically. God met his, his need right there. And then in verse 20... In the very, that's where we left off last week. In the very next verse, verse 20, we see that this passage encompasses a huge chunk of time in Samson's life because it says, Samson went on to judge Israel for 20 years during this period when the Philistines dominated the land. And if you're careful, you can just blow right past that verse. But think about this. It's really remarkable. For one thing, it's kind of the first time we see any good news in this whole story, right? I mean, Finally, finally, he's, he's doing what God had called him to do because in one verse, it captures this 20 long year period of apparent faithfulness um, and, and, and leadership by this very flawed guy. He goes on to be the judge that God had wanted him to be, a guy who's quite frankly made a mess of his life up until this point. Samson had had this personal experience where God met his need and revived him and his strength was returned and refreshed in the desert. And now it seems like he actually, seems like he's actually learned something from his life. It seems like he's actually gotten the, the point he was, and he's gonna be led by God. And this is good news. This is the first good news we've seen in, in this story. He seems to be on the right track, doing what he was created to do. Uh, and this verse just summarizes it says, for the next 20 years, you know what? Samson led faithfully. Samson was a, a good leader. He governed the people righteously. I mean, that's kind of what it's saying here. Samson did a good job. For 20 years, he's doing this. We now see a guy who's really doing remarkably well. And, and you could say in his life, for these 20 years, he's, he's honoring God. He's serving God. And, and he's, he's helping his people. He's doing what he was called to do. He's serving God's people justly and, and uh, the best of his ability. And that's important. I think, I think just like a lot of us here at Journey, we're serving God to the best of our ability. And we try to serve you know, in excellence. And I think that's great. We should all strive to do the very best with the gifts that God has given us. But by the end of today's message, which starts out so hopeful, where we see a guy doing really, really good, we're going to see a guy with so much God-given potential. A guy who seemed to really be on track now. And, and again, we're going to see him make really, really poor decisions because it can happen to anybody. It can happen to anybody. And we see him tragically by, by, by the end of the day. He starts out doing well. He's serving and he's doing everything he's called to do. But by the end of today's message, you're going to see a guy with his eyes gouged out. His hands are shackled. He's humiliated. He's a, a, a laughing stock, sort of a, a circus clown. He's entertaining the people, his enemy, the, the Philistines. And, and that raises a good question. How, how is it, how could a person with so much strength, with so much potential, and, and now with a clear understanding of how to serve God, because he's been doing it for 20 years, so he certainly, he, he's kind of gotten into the flow of things. How, how could a person like that then go on to mess up their life so badly? And the answer is, and it's our key thought for the day. If you're taking notes, um, you should write this down because this is an absolute truth in life. Samson didn't ruin his life all at once. He, he simply ruined it one step at a time. One bad step following another bad step, one step at a time. And we see that he did it the very same way that most people mess up their lives even today. Because most people don't mess up their lives all at once either. Not, not normally. Most people mess up their lives one step at a time. One small step, one compromise at a time. And the whole thing unfolds in Judges chapter 16, starting in, in verse 1. I mean, we just read Samson had this run. He had a good run, like 20 years, right? Good and faithful service to God. And then the Bible simply says this. It says, one day, man, oh man, one 
faithful day. So much in such a tiny phrase, right? One day Samson went to the Philistine town of Gaza and he spent there, he spent the night there with a prostitute. What? Wait a second. Wait, we just read that he had 20 good faithful years of service to God and then the Bible says out of nowhere, just one day, it all comes to a screeching halt. It's interesting to me, if you've ever read the story of King David, when, when he was king over Israel, um, it, it, when he messed up really bad, I mean, he had the, the affair with that lady Bathsheba and she was somebody else's wife. That verse starts out the exact same way because scripture says one day when kings are supposed to be off at war, David wasn't at war. He wasn't where he was one day, one day during his life, he wasn't where he was supposed to be doing what he was supposed to be doing. Rather, he was walking around, he was lounging on his palace terrace, and he looked out and he saw a bath. She had taken a bath and he said, whoa, baby, who is that? Not really, that's my paraphrase, because that's, that's what he thought though, right? It was just a day, just a, a normal day like anyone, any day. And Samson makes a decision that at the end of it, it cost him so very much. And you could actually look back to that day. That was a turning point. Sometimes in your life, you'll have these defining moments. And normally you don't recognize them as defining moments until afterwards. But you'll look back and you'll say, that was the moment when the whole direction of my life changed. That, that one day. And people can just out of nowhere, one day, they can be doing good. And one day they make a decision, they give into a temptation, they head down a road and it's a step-by-step -step process. And it leads to destruction, a downward spiral. And we see this play out in Samson's life. It says one day, just one day, Samson went to the Philistine town of Gaza. He spent the night with a prostitute. Word soon spread that Samson was there. So the men of Gaza, now keep in mind, this is, these are the Philistine people, right? These are the Philistines. So the Philistines, what they do is they gather together, men gather together and waited all night at the town gates. And they kept quiet during the night. They were kind of huddling up and keeping quiet. They saying to themselves, when the light of the morning comes, that's when we'll kill him. I mean, because just 20 years ago, right? Think back 20 years now, there was this, this legendary battle where Samson killed a thousand men. I'm mean, probably relatives to a lot of these people, right? And evidently they still wanted revenge for that day. And so they're gathering a, a group of people. And Gaza, if you don't know this, Gaza was like the headquarters of the, the Philistines. And so our, our foolish, flawed hero, Samson, he, he goes into Philistine territory, right into like headquarters square, leadership square. And what did he do? He, he did it to go see a prostitute. If you look this up, from, from where Samson lived and where he was a judge for 20 years, it was about 25 miles from where he lived and where he served as a judge. And he traveled 25 miles to go and fool around with this girl who, you know, he wasn't supposed to be messing with. And, and oh, by the way, throws away 20 good years of faithful service. Now, this raises another question. Who would be so stupid as to do something like that? That's kind of a foolish decision to make. Who would risk so much for so little? Who, who would do that? And the answer is, well, lots of people, right? Lots of people do this. Lots of people do the same thing every single day, don't they? Don't they? I mean, it happens all the time. I mean, a, a, a good marriage, a good reputation, a good ministry, a good career, all of these good things, life is on track and things are going well, and, and people will risk it all for something that's meaningless. A, a meaningless sexual relationship or a quick high or a, a sinful experience. Out of nowhere, they'll make this decision and they'll go do this. Well, why would somebody risk so much for what in the end is, is so little? And the problem is we see people do it all the time. And they do it one step at a time, too. They, they, we, still, we still do it the same way. I mean, Samson lived thousands of years ago, uh, but people are people. We're still the same. Our clothing changes, our technology changes, but people don't change. We do it the exact same way, and it happens all the time. So how many steps do you think this took him? I said he, he did this one step at a time. I actually looked it up. To travel 25 miles, which is what Samson did, by foot, which is what he did. Um, I try to be thorough. Uh, it, to get from where Samson lived to Gaza... He would have to take 50,250 average adult steps. That's how many steps it takes to go 25, or me anyway. That's how many steps it takes for me to go. He might have been bigger than me, but 50,000 steps, give or take, you, you had to take. So think about this. Samson, he didn't get there all at once, did he? He got there 
one step at a time. And it would take him 50,250 steps to get there. Now, how many people, how many people ruin their lives all at once? Hardly anybody. Most people ruin their lives one step at a time. Not one big step, but they begin to take steps. They, begin, they get off the path. They head down a different direction. We've all either experienced this firsthand or we know someone who has. Or, or at the very least, we've heard about people who just messed up their life completely. Really, really badly. But I don't believe that a person sets out to do that. I don't think people get up in the morning and say, you know what, today I'll think I'll become a drug addict. You know what, I, 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 life's going pretty good. I think what I'll do is I'll just make a bad choice and I'll end up a complete, they probably don't think about that, the, the first drink, the first hit or whatever. You know, you know what, this will be one step. I, I don't think people can think, you know, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna mess up my entire life. I, I don't think that's how it works. I don't think we do it like that. The other, the other thing to think about, which is pretty amazing is, when you think about what Samson was doing here, he had 50,250 opportunities to change direction, but he didn't. He had time to think about it. So many opportunities you, you know, you, to think, what am I doing? This is stupid. Wait a minute, this is not gonna end well. And he had, he had plenty of time to think about these kinds of things and yet he didn't change direction. Why? Because he wasn't planning to mess up his life. He didn't know where this was going to end up. And I don't know a single person said, you know what, my, my five-year plan is to become a complete and total alcoholic. I, I never met anybody who said that. Yeah, you know, I've been working at this for a long time. It took me a while, but I, I, find, I don't know anybody said, you know what, uh, I, I wanna be financially destitute. I wanna make such poor financial decisions that I am embarrassingly broke. I've never met anybody who set out with a goal like that. But what happens is, well, a, a man starts thinking, man, I, I want that. I want that boat, I want that new car, I want those golf clubs and computer, you know? Or we have to have that house in that particular neighborhood because we have to keep up with the Joneses, you know? This is, everybody has it, so, um, and, and, and you know, we'll worry about the pay, payments later. That's what we think, well, we'll worry about that later. We can finance everything. Interest rates are at an amazingly low point right now. You can finance everything, this will be great, right? But then they end up in real trouble. It wasn't the plan. It wasn't, the, they didn't set out and say, this is where I want to end up. But they ended up there anyways, right? Because that's where that road leads. And they didn't get there all, all at once. They didn't get there in one step. They didn't make one decision that led to all that, but they got there one step at a time. And one day they wake up and they're in big, big, big trouble, right? And it all, it all started with that, that one decision. Man, I, I, you know, I don't know a single guy who ever said, you know what, I've got a great marriage. I, I've got, my, my kids are in the right track and they love me and, and things are going so well, but I think I'll just mess it up with a stupid, meaningless office relationship. I don't know anybody who ever said something like that, but that happens all the time. Man, my, and then later there's like, my, my family's falling apart. What happened? What happened? You know, and if they're smart enough, they'll begin to look back and they'll find that day, that one day, one day they made a decision and it happens one step at a time. And so what, what I'm gonna do today is I wanna show you kind of a plan, you can think of this as Samson's plan, uh, authored by Samson, how to mess up your life, and how to ruin your life in, 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 you know, in, in a few easy steps, one step at a time. Uh, and this is not a plan I recommend anybody take, but it, we can learn from it. And so uh, here's the plan, how to ruin your life one step at a time. And we see that Samson, the first thing that Samson did that was bad, and we've seen him do it before in his life too, he taunted his enemy. He didn't take the enemy seriously, he taunted the enemy, he's playing with them. He's got such pride in his own ability. We've seen Samson, he's done this in the past and, and he has this tendency. And verse three says this, so they're waiting for him. They're, they're all gathered together and they're huddled up and they're gonna take him in the morning. He says, but Samson stayed in bed only till midnight. So he's having a good time, I guess, with this unnamed renegade Philistine babe, right? She, we don't know who she is, but he got up in the middle of the night. He took hold of the doors. He went to the, the doors of the gates of the town, including the two posts, and he lifted them up, bar and all, and he put them on his shoulders and he carried them to the top of the hill across from Hebron. So he's, he's with this girl and, and he, he rips the gate off doorposts and, and all. And these were not hollow doors like we use today. These were solid wood doors. I read one commentary about this incident that said they must have weighed at least 700 pounds or more. And he just rips them off the foundation. This isn't a real picture, right? They didn't have cameras then, but he rips them off. Like he puts them on his, his shoulders and he, and he, and, he, and what is he doing? He's taunting them he, because a city's gates, the gates of a city that symbolized the security of the city. They had walls and they had a gate. You, if you were authorized, you can come through that gate. But Samson's ripping it off his post. He said, you guys think you're safe? You're not safe. 
you are not safe around me at all. So he lifts this 700 pound gate above his head, which is kind of how I work out during the week too. I'm kidding. I only do about 500 pounds, but leaving that aside. Either way, <laughs> he's got this thing on his shoulders and he's carrying it up a hill, not down a hill, up a hill. And this guy is strong, right? He's lifting up the gates and he's saying, you're not safe. You have no control around me. You better watch out. I am one bad man pajama, right? And he's taunting the enemy. And, and you need to never forget this, folks. You have an enemy. I mean, your life may be going great and things are great and everything's fine and you feel safe and secure, but you have an enemy, a spiritual enemy, whose mission is to steal and kill and destroy everything that matters to the heart of God. Scripture says that our enemy prowls around like a lion roaring like a lion, looking for someone to devour. And I hope you understand that Satan doesn't want to just wound you. He doesn't want to just set you back. He wants to destroy you. He wants to see you dead. He wants to kill you. And we as people, sometimes, sometimes we underestimate our enemy and we don't think much about him. We, don't, we, we try to kind of live our lives without even considering that this is a reality. And yet we're taunting an enemy that is trying to kill. We're putting ourselves in a very dangerous place because and we think we're okay, but we end up in a place of temptation and we, we kind of do this over and over and over again. And we taunt the enemy and we begin to think that we have our act together and that we're on such a good path and things are going so good. Kind of like Samson was for 20 years, right? We're doing really, really good and we can handle this kind of thing. And so we act like we have our act together and we just, we're such good Christians. We go to church pretty regularly, you know, we're, we're better than those sad sack centers that are out in the world. I mean, we can compare ourselves to all these people and we feel good about ourselves because we're doing better than the other guy, right? So we begin to think that we're strong enough to handle these things. And, and, and some of you guys, you're very different from that. And you're very different from the world and you honor God and, and that's great. And yet you can still find yourself, if you're not careful, if you're not strategic, you still find yourself in a really bad situation. And, and it's not that hard to do. It's really not that hard to do. Because I know a lot of really good Christians, a lot of young Christians who say, you know what? I wanna honor God and so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna have a, a sexual relationship until I get married. I mean, you, you make that decision and then they get a girlfriend or a boyfriend. And they start dating and they start looking into the, you know, thing and they start thinking, well, why do I have to live by these old standards? Not everybody lives by these standards. I don't have to do that, do I? And it's the Old Testament, isn't it? I mean, we begin to ask these questions. Look, you're just putting yourself in a bad situation. You're putting yourself into a situation where you're tempted. And, and I'm not kidding. There's a cost. OK, for everything you do, for every temptation that you succumb to, there is a cost. It, it is going to be paid. And, and, you know, maybe it's a married guy who goes on a business trip and everybody, you know, after the meeting, meeting was successful, they go out and they're having a good time. They start to drink and he thinks, well, I don't really drink, but I can handle it. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm a strong person. So you go to the bar and you have one, two, four, eight, you know, and next thing you know, there's, there's people everywhere. There's girls everywhere. And, and you're just taunting the enemy. You're, you're putting yourself in a situation, you know, you shouldn't be in that really can't do anything good for you or financially you're strapped you're on a tight budget you say well let's just go you know what i don't have anything to do this afternoon. why don't we i know the cars are paid off why don't we go walk around the car lot and just see what the new cars smell like don't you like that new car smell you know you're kind of you're take, you're putting yourself into a place of temptation and we think well you know it's okay i can walk away i can always walk away yes you could and if you're a strong person maybe, maybe you do but you're taunting your enemy i mean we, we, when you think you're strong, that's really when you need to watch out. I love this verse from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, verse 12. It says, if you think you're standing on firm ground, be careful because you could still fall, right? You're a human being, aren't you? I mean, I, I think you guys are all Christians, but you're a human being. You could still mess up. Be careful. Samson, the first thing he did was he taunted his enemy. The second thing that we see him do is that he, be, and he had a habit of doing this all his life. He rationalized his sin away, right? I mean, we see, he, he does this all the time. The very first time we saw it, he, Samson's going after this young, beautiful uh, Philistine babe. And, and he, even though he knew he was not supposed to enter, he took this vow, right? The Nazarite vow. He's supposed to, he's supposed to keep himself pure, supposed to do these things. And, and God had said, you don't go after people in other tribes. You don't intermarry with other tribes. They worship other gods. And so do that. And, and here we see him, as Yogi Berra would say, deja vu all over again, because he's doing the same thing. It's, uh, scripture says this, you're gonna love this verse because this is where it really comes in. Uh, sometime later, Samson fell in love. We don't know how much longer. Apparently that whole thing worked out okay. He didn't get killed there with the, um, 
the guys when he ripped that gate apart. But sometime later, Samson fell in love with a woman named Delilah who lived in the Valley of Sorek. We finally come to the part of the story that uh, introduces us to the infamous Delilah, right? By my count though, this is at least the third time. This is the third time that Samson is messing around with Philistine women. Do you think he had a weakness? Yeah, just a little bit, right? I mean, how many times do we have to see this, this movie play out? He, he does it over and over and over again, even though he knows it is wrong. I mean, it's not like he stumbled into this and had no idea. And, and, and as flawed people, we often can do the same thing. We can become masters at rationalizing our own sin. I don't, I don't know how you do it, but for a lot of us, it's like, well, you know what? This is just my one thing. You know, most of my life is pretty, I got my life on track. I'm a pretty good guy, but this is my, this is my one thing. You know, my one bad thing. That's not too bad, right? If we're, if we're looking at a scale or, hey, it's nobody's business anyways, right? I, I, I can, I'm an adult. This, this isn't hurting anybody. I mean, it, 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 if nobody knows, it's not a big deal, is it? Right? It's my secret little thing. I'm only looking and it doesn't really matter. I mean, it's nobody's business anyways, but mine, right? You shouldn't be judging me. Right? Nobody. Uh, so, yeah, we, we're masters at rationalizing our pet sin, whatever our pet sin is, and that's exactly what Samson does here. And here's what happens: you can read all about this yourself. And it's it's a fascinating story. I encourage you to read this entire chapter. In fact, I encourage you to read these three chapters. But the Philistine guys that uh, Samson taunted with the gate and everything, they kind of come to Delilah and they say, we need you to get Samson to tell us his secret. Why is he so strong? There's got to be something that makes him so strong. And we want to capture him. We will give you 1,100 pieces of silver each if you will get the secret out of this guy. And so what they did is they just bribed her. They bribed her and she accepted the, the challenge. And she said, okay, I'll, I'll get the secret from him. And in verse 6, through 14 of, of chapter 16. I'm just going to give you the real short version because it's, it's quite lengthy. But, and, but it's kind of a silly story. And you heard a lot of it in Sunday school too. But she says, Samson, tell me the secret to your great strength. And so Samson's just toying with her. And he makes up some stupid little thing. And you can tell he wasn't really thinking. It just kind of came to him. He said, if you get seven bowstrings, seven new bowstrings, and you tie me up with seven of those bowstrings, then you know I'll be as weak as any man. You'll be able to, to do whatever you want, you know? And so he goes to sleep and they tie him up. She tells him they tie him up with these bowstrings. And then she says, Samson, Samson, the Philistines are here. And Samson just breaks out of the bowstrings like they're tissue paper. I mean, they're nothing. He beats up some guys, right? And, and, and she, she gets indignant. She says, you're making fun of me. You lied to me. You know, you made me look like an idiot. And, and just tell me what the secret really is. And he says, okay, ropes. It's ropes, really. It's ropes. Brand new ropes. They have to be brand new. Get these brand new ropes. You tie me up with, with those babies and I'll be as weak as any other man. And so he goes to sleep and she, she ties him up. And then she's like, Samson, Samson, the Philistines are here, you know? And he snaps him like, like they're nothing, right? And, and uh, probably laughing the whole way he does it. He chases these guys out or whatever. And she's all mad. You lied to me again. You, you know, you, you don't trust me. You, you know, tell me the real secret. And he's like, okay, really, it's my hair. And he's getting close now, right? Notice he starts out with two ridiculous things, but now it's getting kind of close because really his hair is part of the deal. And so he says, if you take my hair braids and you weave them get together and you pin them up, and stuff. Then, uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm just as weak as any ordinary man. So she does that. And again, Samson, you know, they're on you. And again, he's able to break free. And she's had enough. She said, that's enough. Uh, you don't love me. How can you say, she says, how can you tell me you love me? How can you say that you love me and not share these secrets with me? You've made fun of me three times now. You still haven't told me what makes you so strong. And she, the Bible says she tormented him. She nagged at him day after day after day until he was sick to death of it. She just hounded him. Now it goes without saying, I realize I, I, I probably need to mention this, but I know that, that none of the ladies here would ever do that uh, to a guy. So most of these guys, maybe you never experienced this kind of thing. Um, don't be elbowing anybody or giving dirty looks or anything like that, folks. Uh, but if this happened, you can imagine how, if, if you're a guy, you can kind of imagine, man, I listen to this day after day after day. But what's, what's what happens in verse 17? And you have to wonder why in the world Samson, like he is foolish, but this takes the cake because, uh, I mean, we've seen this over and over and over again. And Delilah, man, she's, she's just bad news. You know, she's bad news right from the start, but he loves her. Why should he ever trust her? And in verse 17, um, it says this. Finally, Samson shared his secret with her. the real. See, finally, he shares the real secret with her. He says, my hair has never been cut. He confesses to her uh, for I was dedicated to God 
as a Nazarite from birth. He knows who he is. Samson knows who he is. And remember his Nazarite vow, don't get drunk, don't touch anything dead, and don't cut your hair, right? And, and so Samson is one out of three, I guess, because we've already seen him violate the other ones. But this one's important. And so Samson said, if my head were shaved, if you were to shave my hair, my strength would leave me and I would be as weak as anyone. And I absolutely love the, the first part of this, this verse because Samson said, I was dedicated to God from my very birth. It's almost as if he's kind of remembering for a moment who he's supposed to be. And it's kind of a poignant moment. He, he now, he obviously is thinking about who he was created to be. And maybe some of you guys are listening today and maybe you've forgotten who you were created to be. Because I can tell you this, maybe you've forgotten that God didn't, he didn't put you on this earth just to take up space. God didn't place you here so that you can convert carbon or oxygen to carbon dioxide. I mean, God has a purpose and a plan for each one of us. And maybe you've forgotten that it's, it's not so that you, I mean, maybe it's great that you're successful or semi-successful at your job and you've got some nice acquisitions of property and, and possessions in your life. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but perhaps for a moment you remember that God says that you are his masterpiece. God created some amazing things and you each one of you are the crowning masterpiece. God actually puts you here in this time, in this place, to utilize your gifts, your passion, and your calling to make a difference in this city and in this church and in this community. That's, that's why you're here. It's not just so you can do well and raise a good family. That's all great. It's not just so you can have a good career. That's fine. That's great. But you actually have a purpose. And sometimes you just have to pause and remember, I was made Whatever you're doing right now, whatever's going on in your life, you were made for more than that. Each one of us were. And Samson, he's thinking back to that. But, but then he says, hey, the real secret to my strength is, is my hair. And in verse 19, uh, it, it says that Delilah, she lulled him to sleep. You know, it's the same story uh, with his head in her lap. And then she, she called the men to come in. They shaved off his, his hair. And in this way, she began to bring him down the bill. The bill is now headed towards the table, right? The bill is, is due. And what happens, the Bible says, and his strength left him for the first time in his life. Samson did, didn't mess up his whole life all at once, but we see from his story, he did it one step at a time. He taunted the enemy. He rationalized his sin. And then finally, Samson assumed, he made this assumption. Is it good to assume? No, they got a little rhyme for that. I won't tell you that rhyme. Maybe you know what it is. Don't assume, right? Samson assumes that... His sin would never be found out. Samson assumed it wasn't going to cost him anything. Just like so many of us, a lot of people today, they think, hey, I can get away with this. I've gotten away with it before. I've been getting away with this for a long time. Nobody's ever caught me. I'll get away with it. He assumed that his disobedience would never cost him. In verse 20, he says, then Delilah cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. Now, now, what does Samson probably think at this point? He thinks, well, I'll get out of this mess. You know, I, I've done this. This is the, you know, we've done this before. I'll just, I'll just shake them myself free. But scripture says when he woke up, he thought, I will do exactly what I've always done and I will free myself. But he didn't realize how sad he didn't realize that the Lord had left him. He didn't realize that he's about to find out though. He really, really is. What he didn't know, what he wasn't aware of is that things had changed. They had drastically changed. Now listen, if you've been listening to any part of this or drifting or whatever, I want you to really listen to this, this part of my message because this is so important. This is the most important thing that you may hear today. Maybe you've gotten away with it once. Maybe you've gotten away with it twice. Maybe you've gotten away with it a number of times. Maybe you've never been found out. Whatever it is in your life, um, and, and nobody, nobody's found out yet. Nobody's held you accountable yet, right? But there'll come a time. There'll come a time when that bill is due. And, and, and you, you may be thinking, well, I've got away with it in the past. It'll just always be like you're assuming that you will all, you're good at what you, how you hide it or whatever. But then the bill comes due. And you, you go to your boss maybe and you say, I promise, God, I promise this time, you know, it'll be different. And your boss says, no, that's, I've had it. We can't. We can't do, go through this anymore. Or because we often get away with it and so much we start to think, well, uh, I'll just do what I did last time. This is exactly what he's thinking. He's thinking, I've been here before. I'll do exactly what I've done. It worked out well then. It's going to work out now, well now. And Samson didn't even think that his sins would ever catch up with him. But they do. And uh, don't think that your sin won't ever catch up with you because Scripture tells us that everything will be, everything is done in the darkness will be 
brought to light at, at some point, right? So he, he tragically thought, I'll get away with this, the same way I've always gotten away with it. It never cost me before. It won't cost me this time either. But he didn't know that the Lord had left him. And here's what it cost him in verse 21. So the Philistines captured him and they gouged out his eyes. They took him to Gaza where he was bound with bronze chains and they forced him to grind grain in a prison like a horse. Where did they take him? To Gaza. What did he do in Gaza? He taunted his enemy, right? They took him right back there. And so many people hear this story and think, man, how did a guy, how did a guy who has so much going for him, he had so much potential, so much strength, not to mention a 20 year career of doing really, really well serving faithfully. How did a guy like that end up in such bad shape? Look, he didn't do it all at once. He did it one step at a time. So here's the deal. For many of you guys right now, at, at this moment, it's kind of like a moment of truth where I, I want you to take a look in the mirror. Maybe if, if not today, sometime during this week, I want you to really take a good, hard look. And uh, I mean, I, I dare you, I double dog dare you to do this. Take some time and just begin to examine your life, to look at your life, whatever it takes. I want you to be really honest with yourself um, because to look in the mirror, you, you have to, it, it takes some strength. It's hard to, a lot of times we don't wanna do this, but I want you to do this because I want you to ask yourself a question in your life. Where in your life are you moving away from God one step at a time? Because for most of us, there's something. There's some area of our life that we have begun to drift. That's what we say, we drifted away from God in this area of our life. And it's easy to rationalize and say, well, I got most of my life on track, but in this area, I'm moving away from God. If you're moving away from God, there's probably a reason while you're moving away from God. And so I want you to think about this. Where, where are you stepping away from God? Not all at once. You're not, not going to give up on your faith or anything, but it, it could be, and you could be anywhere. It could be step number one or it could be step number 50,220. Whatever it is, where are you stepping away from God? For some of you guys, it, it, it might be as simple as, you know, you're, you're not spending any time reading God's word. You don't really pray. You don't really exercise your faith. There's some place in your life where maybe you've moved away from God. You come to church, but you don't let it change you. You don't let God change you by reading his word and allowing it to actually search out the deep parts of your life where God wants to, to work on. You're a Christian, but you're not spending any time serving other people or doing anything that God has called you to do. You've got an outward appearance that it looks like you're doing pretty good, but inwardly, you know there's a part of your life that has drifted away from God. And, and so I encourage you guys just to look at that. It could be some of the things that we saw Samson deal with, lust or pride, you know, or control or anger, all of these different issues. It could be any of that stuff. It could be that financially you're disobeying God. It could be that uh, emotionally you're being distant from your family because you're giving yourself some other place. I challenge you. I challenge you guys to be honest with yourself. Sometimes the hardest person to be honest with is yourself. It really, because you can fool yourself. Samson did it over and over and over again. Because here's the deal. You're, you're only as strong as you are honest. That's the truth. You're only as strong as you are honest. Where are you stepping away from God? And if you see that you are, what are you going to do about it? What can you do about that? How can you change that situation? Because, you, you know, just like Samson, he's walking along towards Gaza. There are plenty of chances where he could have turned around. And sometimes in your life, if you're moving, if you narrow your life, you're moving away from God. You need to just turn around. It's not too late. You still have a chance. You're not there yet. And the best part of all is that when you turn around, you don't have to go far to beat God. He's right there. He, he is right there. He's that good. And I, I want to show you, um, and, and this to me is, is, is one of the most exciting grace-filled verses. It's small, but in all of scripture, you see this. And this is so amazing. What was the outward symbol of Samson's strength that they just cut off? His hair, right? They, they shaved his head. And... and, and uh, his hair is, it, he's publicly shamed, he's grinding grain and stuff. But here's what the Bible says. And God in his mercy is still with Samson. Because the, uh, this is what verse 22 says. But, but, meaning it's not the end of the story, right? There's, there's more here. But before long, his hair, what did it do? It began to grow back, right? That's just how God how good God's grace is. Even though he had disobeyed, even though you know, he, had, he had taunted his, all these things that he's done wrong, God said, that which gave you your strength, I'm gonna return it. I'm going to restore you. With God, it's never too late to be who you might've been. Next week, we're gonna see how uh, 
this plays out in, in his life because uh, just because a person is down does not mean that they're completely and totally out, right? I love this verse, though a righteous person falls seven times, they can get up again. You don't have to stay there. Yes, you, you're, you may be in a situation that you don't like right now, but you don't have to stay there. With God, there's always a tomorrow. Our spiritual enemy loves to make strong people weak, but our God, he loves to make weak people strong. Even when you've fallen down, even when you completely messed up. If you stepped away from God, you can always turn around and God will be right there to meet you. You don't have to travel far. I really hope that you guys will make plans to be here next week for the amazing conclusion uh, of this series because um, it's really what I wanted to say. You know, the first three weeks are the setup for week four. So I hope you'll be here for that. And, and, and we're going to conclude this true life story of a remarkable guy by the name of Samson. Because even though it's a tragic story, there's so much hope. There's so much to learn about his life and and i want you to hear the conclusion i'm going to ask the worship team to come back up and we're going to close in a song and then we will all pray together um